Hello everyone. Today we have Justin here again. Hello Justin. Hello everyone. And we'll talk about Joseph Stilwell, who was the commander of the China Burma India Theater, the US commander, and there's quite a lot of misconceptions about him and also we'll talk about the Stilwell affair as we mentioned in the Ichigo video. Yeah, so this will be a kind of a short companion to that uh, Ichigo video. I won't be able to go into extreme depth just because uh, this is kind of off the cuff. I don't have all my notes. So, uh, but I will talk about this briefly. Uh, if any of you watched the live stream from forever ago, uh, I do talk about this a bit and I want to talk about it in a kind of more ordered way uh, and all that because at the time I was, it was a live stream, it was my first live stream ever. I was getting really passionate and excited and all that kind of stuff. I made a few errors. So uh, I just want to uh, kind of tidy some of that up. So, yes, Joseph Stilwell, he uh, took over as the commander of the China Burma India Theater. Uh, he's probably the most famous person associated with this theater, certainly uh, in the United States. And kind of, he was kind of immortalized as this, uh, you know, this brilliant all American who had come to China to try and salvage the situation from this like laughably inept and corrupt regime. But he, he, he would speak truth to power, but then eventually he was thrown out because of it. Uh, and it's like, it's kind of taught as this, um, it's almost a morality tale and he's kind of a saint uh, that come to teach all of these, you know, stupid Chinese how to soldier. Uh, the reality is... It sounds like a r regular trope, yeah. Yeah, the, the reality is much different. Uh, and a lot of this older narrative, it gets because it gets caught up in Cold War, uh, post-war politics. So, for example, uh, the, the hunt, when uh, Joseph McCarthy started doing his hunt for communists in the U.S. State Department in the 1950s, a lot of his targets were people that had served in China. Many had been involved with Stillwell. There were opponents of McCarthy with, uh, McCarthyism who used Stillwell to demonstrate the criticisms of the State Department uh, made by the nationalists at the time had been correct, and that uh, it was folly to ever support such a terrible regime or whatever. So there's all of this post-war baggage. And as, a, as such, in U.S. academic circles, it made it almost impossible to discuss the nationalists during the Second World War in any other perspective other than that determined by the Stillwell affair. So they was always seen as, the, as viewed through the lens of Stillwell, and criticizing Stillwell became an academic taboo. Uh, and this was also not helped at all by... Of course, a lack of access to sources. We talk about it a little bit in Ichigo, but I mean, you know, the PRC is not letting us into the archives. When a lot of these early histories are written, the nationalists aren't letting anybody into their archives, and they have their own extremely biased, problematic view of the war. So you've got propaganda regime, propaganda regime, and then the U.S. is caught up in their own Cold War mess. And this is where the kind of the old uh, China narrative springs from. Not that it would have helped, because honestly, to, uh, Barbara Tuchman, the most influential historian from this time, uh, she didn't even attempt to look at Chinese sources or anything like that, even if they were available. She basically just put out what Stilwell was saying. So basically, you have this narrative that you have to follow, and 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 because you can't access any other sources, you you would also be basically have no backup in any way. To yeah. provide a different perspective because you would criticize him without proper source backing. Yeah, like it, the sources were basically just English language only and the limited ones that were available at the time viewed through the lens of this Cold War mess. Um, so obviously it creates a very toxic situation. Uh, one, of the, one of the more recent historians of the war, um, can't, I don't have his full name written down, but you, uh, he wrote a series of uh, chapters uh, in a book called The Dragon's War. Uh, in his mini review of still uh, Barbara Tuchman's Stillwell and the American Experience in China, uh, is as follows. So, written at the height of the anti-war movement in the early 1970s, this popular account of Stillwell's wartime experience in China echoes the sentiment of that time. That is, U.S. foreign policy had been based on an unwise policy of supporting unpopular dictators by neglecting the progressives who represented the future of the country the United States uh, was involved in. With this approach, the Stillwell biography portrays a temperamental general as a thoughtful, farsighted, and progressive fi uh, fighting against an inept and insensitive Chinese regime. It is fair to say that everything, is said, uh, everything that is said about Stillwell in this account is factually sound, yet a remarkable amount about Stillwell, which is amply available from the newly opened Stillwell archives, would make 
uh, Stilwell a much less sympathetic fi uh, figure in wartime China. And it is what is not said about Stilwell that is most revealing and renders this hagiographical account in dire need of improvement, end quote. So that's, and that's about the nicest review I've seen of Stilwell and the American <laughs> experience in China from recent historians. There's people that go in a lot harder than you does. Uh, particularly Jay Taylor, who uh, I think in some areas actually goes too far in the other direction, but keep in mind that Yu's view is like, that's the baseline now <laughs> for understanding Tuchman. Uh, so anyway, really Stilwell's time as the commander starts off disastrously. Uh, in Burma in 1942, he is given, uh, I think if I remember from memory, three Chinese armies, uh, the best armies that China has. In fact, Chang tells him this. But Chang also explains to him that even though they are the best of the Chinese armies, they still aren't a one-for-one -one match with the Japanese and that he should be careful and use them appropriately, largely on the defensive and then just maybe counterpunch when the Japanese overextend. But don't expect them to you know, be able to steamroll a prepared Japanese def uh, defense or anything like that. It's just not in the cards. And also the British and the Chinese, they're telling him that like Burma's basically unsalvageable. They should pull back and establish defensive lines. Uh, Stilwell, who is basically completely out of touch with the situation and before had, you know, his most, really one of his most significant commands was sitting behind a desk as the uh, military attache to China for a while and he spoke Chinese. He had no real, like, large unit command experience. And he cooked up a brilliant idea to just re counterattack into the teeth of the Japanese army and retake Rangoon. With bare, you know, the the air was heavily contested. His flanks were open. The Japanese were fully prepared and supplied, and were gonna be able to really wallop them. Everybody's saying it's a bad idea. He rams it through. It, it predictably blows up in his face. Uh, over the entire time this is happening, he's not actually informing Chang what is even happening. So Chang is like, "What the hell's going on with all of my armies that I gave you?" And uh, Stillwell is not even talking to him. Uh, the whole thing starts to unravel, and Stilwell abandons his command. Now, I did mention this before in the live stream, but I really need to drive this home. It's not because he was coward. Uh, it's because he was someone that had been promoted out of his depth, and he was thrust into a bad situation in the middle of an operation going bad. And he lost situational awareness, and he thought his command had collapsed, when in fact there were actually still meaningful Chinese units resisting. So, in, in, so the general just up and left. Uh, while his command was fighting, so so he left because because he assumed that everything had broken down and he yeah. had to save his life. Exactly. Like uh, so, you can see. So it, that he's justified in that sense, um, but also in reality, it's impossible to see how if he had done this with say if he'd been deployed to North Africa and pulled this trick, uh, he would have been at the very least canned and quite possibly court-martialed. Uh, like it was a very egregious. Thing to do, of course. In the older narratives, wasn't there something similar in North Africa with uh, uh, with Kasserine? Kasserine Pass, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. In fact, actually, like even Marshall at the time, I was looking at what was going on in Burma, and he's like, he asked Chang, he's like, is everything like okay? Is still well working out? And, and at this point, really, uh, Chang opted to preserve the new relationship with the Americans. So he said, oh yeah, it's fine. Uh, but really, in hindsight, what he should have done is thrown Stillwell <laughs> under the bus right now, because it was only going to be downhill from here. But of course, this was portrayed post-war as Stillwell's famous walk out of Bur Burma and how brave he was and enduring the hardships of uh, marching out of Burma. Of course, when people actually looked at the reality, for one thing, it was mostly done by Jeep. Uh, it wasn't like him physically marching out of Burma the whole way. And also, uh, the deprivations that he faced were a fraction of what the Chinese forces faced that were effectively covering his rear. <laughs> uh, and they managed to, some of them managed to actually march out of China, uh, out of Burma while fighting the Japanese and trying to hold things together. Uh, in the words, or uh, rather poetically, um, I think this originated with Richard Frank, but from Chang's perspective, Stilwell had marched into Burma with uh, three Chinese armies and marched out with three Chinese squads. Uh, and then you have these, and then you have these full, you know, the, you have these uh, older post-war histories uh, condemning Chang for not loving Stillwell after this whole mess. <laughs> um, even that was largely of Stillwell's doing. Uh, 
so it, it's very uh, problematic. And then Stillwell would, of course, have to um, retrain uh, and rebuild uh, the forces, the Chinese forces in India, and bring in uh, further reinforcements and all that kind of thing. And this is where Stillwell was actually quite good at. You know, I'm not going to completely just. Uh, I think Stillwell was the wrong man for the wrong position, and if he had been more appropriately used, he would have done a much better job. Um, he didn't. He didn't think strategically very well. He was extremely petty. Uh, he never forgave or forgot. He hated everyone around him. In fact, I've got uh, Hans van der Ven uh, kind of has a nice paragraph that illustrates this, um, where he says. Uh, it did not help that General Stilwell was a difficult man. With the exception of General Marshall, he held everybody in contempt, not just Chiang Kai-shek, the peanut, his nickname, or the nationalist commander-in-chief, He Ying Ching, quote, graced by no distinction in combat command, these are all quotes from Stilwell, but also on the British side, General Archibald Wavell, quote, a tired, depressed man, pretty well beaten down. Uh, General Alexander, quote, astonished to find me, a mere goddamn American, in command of Chinese troops. Extraordinary! Look me over as if I had just crawled from under a rock, end quote. And Montbatten, one of the, quote, candy kids that is someone enjoying life at the splendorous headquarters of Southeast Asia Command at Candy on Sri Lanka, end quote. His fellow Americans fared no better. Stilwell could not stand General Chenault, of course, uh, but he also had little regard for his successor, General Wiedemeyer, quote, good God, to be ousted in favor of Wiedemeyer, that would be a disgrace, end quote. So th this is the kind of temperament that Stilwell had. Um, and this is not the person you want in command of a theater where not only are you dealing with operations and tactics, or not even tactics, but operations and strategy, and you're dealing with politics and in, you know, alliance relations, you know, dealing with the Chinese and the British and all of these different commanders and generals, people back in the US, etc. He was he did not have the temperament for this at all. He he should yeah. have been nowhere near that. <laughs> this is so so it was it sounds like a complete opposite to Eisenhower, who was from what I understand chosen because he could deal with all all the politics of all the egos of these different commanders. Exactly. He was, he was like the polar opposite of Eisenhower. And he, he was, still was most at home on the ground with his soldiers, where, which he did have great respect for both the American troops and the Chinese troops. He never actually used uh, that I've seen any kind of Chinese racial slurs or anything like that. He always, uh, he referred to them as pings, which is kind of the, the, the respectful Chinese term for soldier. He, mm -hmm. he, he loved his men. And he was a very good tra uh, trainer of men, and that was where he was at home. And he was and he was fairly good, uh, kind of tactical commander lower down. He would have made a great uh, person if he had just had to been able to focus on that kind of stuff. Uh, but the thing is, is that he was promoted well beyond his ability. He was thrust into this complex theater command that he was not equipped to deal with, and this is what kind of is the root cause of a lot of the problems that stem from that. So basically. A regimental or division commander probably would have been more yeah for probably him. for him and this isn't to denigrate him there's it's yeah, perfectly no. reasonable to to have that kind of skill there's people that are probably much better as a theater commander not dealing with all the little underlings uh then uh it's important for instance i i suck at diplomacy for me it will be a catastrophic position yeah mm -hmm. but i i can do other stuff rather well i would say so everyone everyone has different capabilities mm -hmm. You you would be a good diplomat. I would be in this position. Yeah. But um, so to fast forward a little bit, I mean, there's a lot of stuff to to go on here. This is one of those things where you just have to read a whole bunch of books on it because we'd be here for three hours talking about every single thing that went on. Uh, but we're gonna fast forward to Ichigo because we were talking about uh, that in the previous podcast. So Ichigo is kind of the beginning of the end for Stillwell. Uh, as the commander of CBI. Uh, so despite being a theater commander, he was fixated on recovering Upper Burma, so a very tiny fraction of his command, and spent most of his time at the head of a couple Chinese divisions, uh, X-Force, that he had trained in India. He was almost completely out of the strategic loop, stomping around the Burmese jungle, and was largely ignorant of the scale and danger posed by Ichigo, which was happening in the theater he was supposed to be in command of. 
Like, this is equivalent of Eisenhower not knowing that the Battle of the Bulge was happening because he was leading a division from the front somewhere else along the line. Like, it's completely ridiculous when you place it in a European context. In fact, this led to the, uh, the jibe that Stilwell was the, quote, uh, best three-star company commander in the U.S. Army. Quote. Um, you know, it's a very gr- uh, grievous problem for a theater commander. I mean, literally, the enemy is launching the largest offensive in its history in the theater in your command of, but you don't seem to fully understand what's happening. So Chang consistently disagreed with Stilwell over the significance of the Burma campaign, uh, rightfully in my view, uh, and that of the majority of historians. In fact, even when he finally opens the Lido Road, um, it, its tonnage actually that was being moved by the road was dwarfed by the hump at this point in time, the uh, flights over the Himalayas. Uh, so it actually had a very negligible impact on the war. Uh, y Force, uh, which was another force of well-equipped uh, elite U.S. trained divisions that were based in Yunnan province, uh, were deployed to Burma in support of Stilwell, but only after the general threatened to withhold U.S. supplies from the nationalists, because Chang wanted to use this force as a reserve as Ichigo began to unfold. Uh, but Stilwell would have none of it. Uh, he was focused on his pet project in Burma, and he wasn't going to let anything else distract him from that. This despite China was facing six times more Japanese troops than those faced by all the allies in Burma. Yet the Burma campaign had drained off almost all of the best trained and equipped nationalist forces. So this is kind of, you know, this is one of those examples um, where China was being forced basically at gunpoint with uh, the threat of having their supplies cut off to send their best forces away from what they really needed to defend to go to, uh, to go to Burma into this kind of periphery operation to try and reclaim Burma as their position in China was completely collapsing. That's insane. Did Ch- uh, Cheng not intervene with uh, Marshall or something? Um, no, because uh, everyone at this at this point in time, specific point in time, the U.S. was on Stillwell's side. It was kind of uh, Stillwell had done a very he was very good. Uh, he was actually a media whore and very good at shaping his image and uh, working with Marshall and things like that back stateside. And he would get people, particularly the Americans, on his side because, he, again, he's you know, the brilliant all-American trying to deal with this inept regime that can't do anything right. So the Americans were uh, very, very predisposed to believing whatever Stillwell was saying. And really, as, Ich- as Ichigo was in full swing, so like the first war zone is like disintegrating, they're advancing in southern China... Uh, Chang and Chenault, who's like an, you know, a commander of an air force, but he's acting more like a theater commander than Stilwell, uh, are screaming for assistance from Stilwell. Like, they're like, oh my god, this is really bad. Like, we need reinforcements. Uh, and Stilwell, partly out of a fixation on his own campaign and partly out of petty vengeance for, what, uh, for both real and imagined slights, he uh, famously dismissed the pleas with three words, quote, let them stew quote uh again like this this kind of attitude it's like can you imagine if eisenhower tried to pull this crap like how fast he would have been shit canned <laughs> yeah it's not gonna like, fly so Ch- chenault could also do nothing about him yeah Ch- yeah the, the, uh, stillwell hated you Chen- and chenault hated stillwell uh they basically had no meaningful working relationship they were constantly at uh loggerheads with each other but and marshall and the others about Chino, I mean, Chino was was way longer in in, mm-hmm. in China from what I remember, right? Yeah, uh, the, it's just because you know he was like an Air Force guy. Uh, he he had his own kind of schemes too, like not like he wasn't completely brilliant. He was uh, obsessed with setting up all the bomber bases in China and all that kind of stuff. The whole rah rah air power wins wars, which is part of the reason why army guy like hardcore army guys like Stillwell and all that couldn't stand them. Oh, okay, um, so yeah, yeah there's okay. like that element in thrown in there as well. But this was kind of, and again, this was hardly the first time such circumstances had been forced on the on the Chinese. Uh, they constantly have their forces pulled away to benefit the Western allies in the wider war, but then actively undermine China's own interests. Um, and really, this it kind of all comes to loggerheads with uh, messages. And this is where I don't have detailed notes. So I'm going to be kind of general. Um, st- uh, the gist is Stilwell tries to gain full control over the entire nationalist military, along with a couple other concessions that Chang read, and honestly, quite reasonably, as Stilwell was basically demanding that China become almost like an American puppet state. 
And the U.S. was kind of behind this for a brief period, but like Chang finally, like this was the moment where it was like, no, we have had it. I have had enough. Chang need or uh, Stillwell needs to go. And finally, uh, they they've kind of realized that yeah, okay, like this is all imploding. We need to get rid of Stillwell to preserve any kind of semblance of order. Uh, so they replace him with General Wiedemeyer, who was uh, actually a much more capable general. But by this point, everything was so toxic. Uh, everything was so in such bad shape that he, uh, Chang was starting to go a little bonkers militarily. Uh, and you can see that really strongly in the post-Civil War period, uh, where he's like just dumping troops in Manchuria and having them just keep getting destroyed. And like Wiedemeyer's like, oh, maybe this isn't a brilliant idea. <laughs> but uh yeah, so and Wienemeyer actually writes a report uh before Stillwell is replaced about the situation. So he kind of he told the celebrated strategist uh, Stanley Embick that quote, my predecessor had neither the character nor the ability to be a good regimental commander. He spent so much time in the jungles of Upper Burma commanding a few battalions and acquiring a great deal of publicity, so that he neglected sorely the responsibilities inherent in his position, end quote. Uh, one of Wiedemeyer's first acts was to recommend that Frank Dorn, who was Stillwell's number two, uh, had, had been in command of Y-Force, uh, not only just recalled, but demoted, uh, but a recommendation that was actually not accepted. But he concluded uh, that Dorn, uh, in an efficiency report, was, quote, of questionable loyalty, uncooperative, extremely selfish, of immature judgment, and not dependable, end quote. Which is probably why him and uh, Stillwell got along so well. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's kind of the uh, the whole this whole mess, and also this uh, this is tied up to the Dixie mission is launched uh, partly in response to kind of perceptions of Ichigo and the nationalists not fighting. They start looking to hey maybe we can arm the communists because they're the ones doing the real fighting or whatever. So all of this is like unraveling. I mean, you can see why Chang is furious because now they have he has like he's been treated like shit by the Americans for years at this point, and now they're going to go to his like absolute death enemies and start arming them and you can see why he's so infuriated by this whole process and kind of just like by the end of world war ii kind of just broken um yeah understandably yeah but this is this is kind of the that that's kind of the context for the Stillwell affair and again it got caught up in these post-war politics so it's only very recently like in the last 15 or so years that uh, new histories using Chinese sources and all the new American sources available and all Japanese sources are tying all of this together into a much more balanced narrative than the, you know, the brilliant general Stillwell being ignored by the corrupt regime. Um, and then being, you know, being thrown under the bus for speaking truth to power, uh, which is kind of that old, old narrative that no longer holds any water uh, in academic circles. He did, he did leave papers and also extensive diaries uh, and all that kind of stuff, which is where, because uh, he was quite colorful in his diaries, that's probably where a lot of those insults come from. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and he's got a lot of other quotes that I can't quote exactly, but when he was making his final moves against Chang, he, uh, I, I'm going to misquote it because I don't have it in front of me, but he, like, he stared Peanut in the face and kicked him in the pants. Uh, that kind of stuff was pulled out of his diaries. Um, okay, and he has. Uh, there's a bunch of Stillwell papers as well that are held, and more were released uh, in I think about 30 years ago or so. Um, one of the first articles that kind of started problematizing the legacy of Stillwell was written by Hans van de Ven, um, and it's called Stillwell in the Stocks. I think it was from the early 2000s or late 90s. I can't remember. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the uh, very short rundown of Stillwell. Um, the short twenty-five minute run. Yeah. Still well. yeah. <laughs> I, I I knew why I said ma let's make it different as a second video of this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Justin. Yeah, no problem. And thank you for watching, and see you next time. Bye.